Okay, good morning. Well, I know all of you understand what coal is, and when coal was located close to surface, of course, we can physically remove it um, by mining operations. Um, the same coal that we see near surface or at surface can be buried at much deeper depths, and when it's buried at deeper depths, it contains more and more gas, but it's too far underground in order to mine, but we can use other methods to extract the gas. So we're not physically taking the coal out, we're getting the, the product, which is uh, essentially methane. So just as an overview, uh, what's shown on this slide on the bottom right is, is a particular example of coal. Coal can be black, it can be brown, it can be fractured, it can have impurities. There's lots of different types of coals around the world. And part of it also is dictated by the depth that the coal is buried. All of the coals that we look at are, are cover a very large area, just like the unconventional oil and gas we've talked about. One of the unique things is the gas is not initially free to move like it is in uh, conventional reservoirs, and even in unconventional tight reservoirs and oil reservoirs. Uh, you find that the gas is free to move, but here it's absorbed to the matrix, and initially, as you'll see, we have to produce water first in order to encourage the gas to be produced to lower the pressure. And then also the completion technique, the technique which the wells are drilled and that the gas is introduced to the well can be quite unique and, and specific, so that's critical. There's many different coal bed methane basins in the world, and one of the things that's different is um, there's many commercial coal bed methane projects outside of the United States. And although shale gas and tight uh, and shale oil is prominent around the world, the United States dominates in terms of commerciality, whereas coal bed methane has been around for a long time. And close to you in Australia, as you can see, there are a lot of projects, and now they're taking coal and putting it on ships uh, for LNG um, with the emerging energy markets. And this just summarizes those countries, and I'll leave you with it, ranging from the United States, China, Australia, Indonesia, close to here, and, and many places in between. This slide attempts to show and distinguish some of the mechanisms, which are quite different. I'll just spend a little, little time on this and then move more quickly to finish. On the left is a, is a more conventional sandstone reservoir. You see that there's some spaces where, we call it pore space, where the gas is. And then the, um, the yellow material is the sand grain. So sand grains with gas in it, and the gas is free to move. It, can, it moves quickly. And the production characteristics shown in the bottom left are also quite different to methane. Your first day is your best day on a conventional reservoir, and even unconventional oil and gas. The first gas to come is free gas at high rate, and you get good cash flow, and then, so you're getting a lot of your money back early. MPV is driven by the profile. On the other hand, coal, there's two things that are different. The blue area, which is key, it blue represents water, is cleats or fractures, and that's the producing conduits. You need two things to make coal work. You need to have storage in the brown area, and you need to have a way to get it out, which is where the blue cleats are. And what happens is the blue cleats, the productive area, contains water initially. Okay, so in order to get the gas out of the brown area, you have to initially produce water. You see the, in the lower, left, lower right that the production initially, there's no gas at all. You're not getting any cash flow. So for a, for a well like this, uh, initially, you're in a negative cash flow until the gas starts to increase, plateaus and decline. So it's a bit more tricky to forecast, and the profiles look quite different. Secondly, if you're putting it on an LNG ship and want a nice constant um, plateau rate to service the LNG plant, you can imagine you have to be drilling more and more wells uh, so that you can get an overall profile that fits the criteria of the project. Coal, I'll move through this quickly, comes from vegetation, high carbon material that we see at surface, uh, which is then subsequently buried uh, progressively on the left from plants to peat to lignite to coal. So it takes a lot of time, a lot of pressure, and a lot of depth. So there's different types of coal depending on what the depth is and how mature it is. If you take, for instance, peat, which is the early stage of formation of coal, it may start with six meters, and under the pressure and depth that it's buried, it finishes up at 0.3 meters, so there's a tremendous amount of compression needed. There's many different types of coals. The trick is we can go out and drill wells, physically take samples, we can look at it at surface, and try and understand what we have. And for instance, in the upper right, you'll see some white areas. These um, are cleats that have been filled with a substance called calcite. So that's an impurity, and, 
has caused this coal that would have been a good coal to be not so good coal because the pathways have been closed off. This slide is a little bit busy, but along the bottom axis, you'll see starting with lignite all the way to anthracite represents the maturity of the coal. How deep is it? And on the other axis, there's two things going on. You can see the yellow and red line. Okay, so as we start near surface, there's a low gas content, and as we bury it, we get higher and higher gas content, and the yellow line eventually plateaus out. The other thing that's happening, those cleats that I told you, they're very important. They also increase with depth to a point, but after about a thousand meters, you see the red line falls back down. We don't have any permeability, so very deep coal can't be produced. So there's a sweet spot, and so right in the middle is the best place to be. And you can see along the top, countries like Australia are blessed with a, a very wide range of coals, um, including those in the sweet spot. And that's why there's some LNG projects for them right now that are either started or, or will be starting in the near future. And LNG, as I mentioned, is a technique, I know you've heard of it, what are we doing? We're taking gas molecules um, at atmospheric conditions and wanting to move them to the market. So the way we do that is we reduce the temperature dramatically and turn uh, gas into a liquid, minus 162 degrees centigrade. And what that does, it takes one unit of volume and makes 600 units of volume when we get to the other end. So we we chill it, we turn it into a liquid, and when we get to the market, in this case coming from Australia in the Asian market, the ship doesn't have to go very far, we then heat the gas back up and away we go and sell it. So that's what LNG is all about. And then, as I mentioned, in Queensland and Australia, there's multiple projects. There's four. One of them's a bit on hold, but they're very, very big projects. Coal bed methane has never before in the world been put into LNG. LNG is not a new thing, um, but putting coal bed methane on a ship is... And these projects are very expensive, um, and so that's why one of them perhaps uh, has been uh, put on hold just at this stage. Turning to this graph, just to show in Australia, which is close to here obviously, the black line is Australia's total natural gas production, including both conventional gas and unconventional gas. And you'll notice distinguishing characteristic there is the red line, which was conventional gas from the Cooper Basin in the middle of Australia. When it started declining, you can see that in um, the same time frame, the blue line and the green line, which are the two key basins producing coal gas in Queensland, increased at dramatic rate. So much so that they not only replace the conventional gas decline, but they cause the overall black line to continue to increase. And that's projected to continue to increase into the future. So coal bed gas become a very big thing in Australia. Highlight the difference between conventional and unconventional. We've mentioned permeability. Conventional reservoirs have high permeability. Unconventional reservoirs do not. We need to do something to create permeability such as fracture stimulation. And it's been very successful. In coal, um, it's a little bit different as you mentioned. You have the permeability, but you have to produce the water first. Completion type's important. And when we think about the rest of the world, and even in the United States, all these different basins took a lot of wells to be drilled in experimentation to find what works best. So where things are more expensive relative to the U.S., a lot of activity has to take place to delineate these very large areas and find, A, what's the best areas to produce, particularly under a more uh, difficult pricing environment, and also what's the best way to um, complete the wells. Many of these projects require a significant amount of capital investment up front, a significant amount of learning to establish just what we have. And as you saw in the case of coal bed methane, uh, even though the per well charge may be smaller, you still have to find a lot of samples over a vast area. So people coming in early into a shale trend have to spend money, investors have to be patient, but the rewards can be great. Once we know what to do, it becomes almost in the United States, we say a cookie cutter, a similar method like a factory. We can do it. Just finding the right method is the magic. 